Now, once I have purchased my inventory, another possible transaction that could occur is a purchase allowance. And what happens in this situation is sometimes there is a problem with the merchandise. Perhaps the merchandise is defective, or maybe it simply is not exactly what we expected, we're not satisfied. And if that's the case, we could communicate with the vendor and they will possibly give us a purchase allowance. And if they do that, it actually reduces the price. And sometimes they're inclined to do that because you know that saying, the customer is always right. So if we're sat dissatisfied in some way, a lot of times they'll give us this purchase allowance to keep us happy and satisfied so that way we will continue to buy from them in the future. So to see an example of a purchase allowance, we have a vendor who has issued a $250 purchase allowance and this is to resolve a problem that we had with the merchandise. So the way this would be recorded, I would actually debit accounts payable, $250, and I would credit merchandise inventory, $250. This reduces the liability and also reduces the cost of my inventory. So that would be the appropriate way to record that if I'm given a purchase allowance. In addition to that, I sometimes have to pay the shipping on my purchases. And if that's the case, that would also require a journal entry. In this example, we're going to pay $50 shipping, and this is on a purchase that we previously made. In this case, I'm going to debit merchandise inventory and credit cash. And the reason I do that is because I want to increase the value of the inventory. That's another $50 that I paid just to obtain that inventory. And remember, I want that inventory account to reflect all the costs, the actual cost. So when I have to pay the shipping on my own purchases, I will record it in that manner. So that pretty much takes care of purchases. And like I said, I could have a cash purchase, credit purchase, purchase allowance, and also possibly shipping. Now, once we've covered purchases, then we want to take a look at sales because ultimately that's why we are purchasing this merchandise. We want to turn around and sell it to our customers and hopefully we're going to make some money in the process. So every time we have a sale, that's going to have an effect on our company and we're going to have different transactions related to sales and we'll record journal entries for each one of those. So the first example that we have of a sale happens to be a cash sale. And of all the different possibilities with sales, this one is the most straightforward. And the great thing about a cash sale is that we get the money up front. We get the money immediately. So that's always a good thing. So in this case, we have just completed a cash sale for $1,000. The merchandise had cost $700. So in that case, we have two different prices. There is a retail price and the cost. So that means we actually will have to record two journal entries rather than one. In fact, it's a good thing to remember that every time there's a sale, there will always be two journal entries. So to record the retail price, I will debit cash because I'm receiving that money and I'll show the revenue by crediting sales. And then to record the cost, I will debit cost of goods sold, which is an expense account, and credit inventory. And the reason I credit inventory is because if I've sold the inventory, it's gone. I no longer have it. So I want that to be removed from the inventory account. So that is the way that we always record a cash sale. Now another possibility is we could also have a credit sale. And in this example, we have the exact same information except for the fact 
that it is a credit sale. In this case, we are allowing the customer to charge. And sometimes we would do that because it sometimes encourages people to buy more than they otherwise would have. But the downside is we're not going to get the money up front. And in fact, if you look at these two journal entries, they are almost exactly the same as the previous two journal entries. The only difference is this account right here. Instead of debiting cash, I debit accounts receivable. This is an asset and it's a receivable. That means people owe us this amount of money and hopefully we're going to receive the money. But there is a downside to this. Every time I have a receivable, I also face risk and there's a risk that the customer will not pay. So that's the downside. If I let people charge, maybe it does encourage them to buy more, but it does give me a risky situation because I may not end up getting that money. We hope that we will, but you never know. It's always a possibility. Now, if we're going to receive a payment on this credit sale, we have to talk about the discount. Earlier, we talked about purchase discounts. And we said that vendors that we buy from offer us a potential discount. Well, we do the same thing for our customers. We're going to offer our customers a possible discount. In fact, here are the credit terms that we offer. 110 N30. So we offer a 1% discount if they pay us within 10 days. Otherwise, they have to pay the full price and they have 30 days to do that. So it's a slightly different set of terms than the credit terms that were offered to us. But in this case, it's the same principle. We want to encourage these people to pay us as quickly as possible, and maybe it's worth it to give them a discount if it encourages them to do that. So the subsequent entry, again, there are two versions. If they pay us within 10 days, that is within the discount period. So I'm going to debit cash, but instead of $1,000, it's only $990. And why is it only $990? Because I'm only going to get 99% of the price. So 1,000 times 0 .99 is 990. So when that customer pays me, I will receive that much cash. On the credit side, I eliminate the receivable with a credit to accounts receivable. Notice that they do not match. So to make this journal entry balance, that's where I need that extra $10 debit. And that goes to sales discounts. That is an expense account, and it helps me keep track of all the different discounts that I've given to my customers. But it's also possible that we may not receive the payment until after that 10-day period has expired. So if that's the case, we would debit cash 1000 and credit accounts receivable 1000 So in other words, they have to pay us the entire amount. So both of those are possibilities. It all depends upon the day on which they pay us. Now earlier we talked about the fact that when we purchase merchandise from a vendor, we may be unsatisfied with that merchandise. That's always a possibility. And if that happens, we had a purchase allowance. Well, the same thing is true on sales. It's possible that our customer may not be satisfied with what we have sold them. So if that's the case, we have the option or the possibility of allowing the customer to return. So if you take a look at this example, we have a customer here that's going to return some merchandise. And we don't really know the story behind it, but we would assume that it was either defective or possibly they just weren't satisfied. So in order to keep this customer happy, we've decided to allow them to return it. The portion that they are returning is worth $500, but it had cost us $300. So again, you've got a retail price and a cost. So that requires 
two different journal entries. And when you look at these journal entries, it's almost an exact reversal of the original sale. See, on the original sale, we would have debited accounts receivable, so we're doing the opposite because that reduces the amount that they owe us. And then on this entry, we would have debited cost of goods sold and credited merchandise inventory. So notice now it has been reversed. So because it is a return, we just reverse everything. And the only real difference is up here on sales. Instead of just using sales, I use a brand new account called Sales Returns and Allowances. And this is an account that I use anytime a customer returns merchandise or if I decide to give them some type of a price reduction. So that would be the proper way to record a return. Now we may not always have a return. Another possibility is I could simply let the customer have a sales allowance. This is very similar to a purchase allowance. I'm just giving them a discount. And maybe I'm doing this to keep the customer satisfied and keep them happy. So if I do that, this would be a good example. Say that we have that same situation, customer is not satisfied, but instead of having them return the merchandise, we could simply say, here's a discount. We're going to give you a $100 reduction in price. And we could do that. And maybe it's worth it. You know, maybe it's worth losing $100 if it keeps that customer satisfied and it keeps them coming back to buy from us again and again. So in this case, again, I debit sales returns and allowances and I credit accounts receivable. That lowers the amount that they owe us and shows that we did give them a price reduction. And that account lets us keep track of all those allowances. So those are the various transactions that we could have for sales. And as you can see, purchases and sales, you know, this is the kind of thing that we didn't have previously because we were dealing with service companies. But now that we're starting to deal with merchandise companies, from time to time we will have situations where people purchase and sell merchandise. But when those situations come up, we will know exactly how to account for that using these journal entries.